Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants, and welcome to episode nine of the Restaurant Marketing Podcast, Secret Source, What I Learned from Alinea. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret source. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success, your secret sauce. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Hope you got a lot out of our restaurant marketing lessons learned from South Carolina. I know we had a lot of restaurants listening in Charleston, so big hello to everyone out there. I can't wait to get back there. So today's episode, we're going to cover what we learned from our experience at Alinea. So for those of you who haven't heard of Alinea, one of the best restaurants in the world in Chicago. We were lucky enough to get there for the National Restaurant Association trade show. And so we made a booking about eight weeks in advance we needed to, to get into Alinea. And so later on in the episode, we're going to be talking about all of the things that I think make it such an interesting experience, but more importantly, the things that you can use in your chief financial officer going through the my expense account and saying, well, what did you spend all of this money on? So part of my risk management strategy for that was to actually take the CFO to Chicago and to take her to Alinea. So luckily enough, it's my wife, my beautiful wife, Tina. And so I thought if she is in on the meal, then she's not really going to question it when she goes through and says, wow, what did we spend all of this money on? Having said that, and I've heard a lot of really good things. Having said that, I have eaten at one of these, you know, top 10 restaurants in the past. I've eaten at one of the restaurants that's the number one in that country. And I won't mention it because the experience wasn't that great. I thought the food was really good. Some of the service I found to be quite lacking. And there was a couple of things that I thought, you know, for a a top 10 restaurant in the world, I would have thought the service would have been a lot better. So I was hesitant, you know, is it going to live up to the hype? And we've all been to those restaurants where everyone talks about how fantastic it is. And in reality, it's not that fantastic, but I think people have blown a lot of money there and they don't want to admit the fact that the restaurant ain't that great. So we had pretty high expectations And I have to say, you know, it was an amazing event. So what we're going to do is we're going to break out what made it amazing and what is it that you can do in your restaurant. I don't really want to talk about the food, okay? It's clear that there are some really, really gifted chefs working at Alinea, okay? And if you're running a local Indian restaurant or a local Chinese, you're going to struggle to match them. You're going to come nowhere close to the level of culinary skill that these guys have. So what are the other bits that we can take out of an experience at Alinea that can help you increase the profitability in your restaurant? And I think the number one thing that I took out of the experience at Alinea was innovation. There were some of the things that were quite simple and it's interesting because some of the things that are interesting at Alinea, we've seen in other places around the world. A lot of places when you go to a degustation menu, and that's what it is, it's a 15-course degustation menu, we had it with the matching wine list. A lot of things that we've seen, we've seen other places. So, and, you know, they may have copied them from Alinea. Alinea, you know, they probably travelled around the world and they're picking up the best things that they can see from other places. But in the wine list, so there was beer and sake in there, which is exactly like Esquire. So Esquire in Brisbane, who has got an amazing sommelier, well, they did have when we were there a couple of years ago. He's only something like 22 years old, but really amazing, great in-depth knowledge of the wine. And he really built a story about where we were going. So it took us on a journey with the food and with the wine. And on the wine list, there was beer and sake. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Same thing with Alinea. So 
for the Thai meal that they had, there was a beer and there was also a sake. And I think it's just interesting the way that it was presented with the sommelier. The sommelier was really sort of, he didn't just say, oh, this is this from this place. He explained how it was meant to match with the food. I had some questions about it, about some of the wines. He was able to answer those. So just a little bit, you know, just the things that we do that we traditionally do, what could we do that we change a little bit? Now, of course, you know, the interesting thing about having a fairly expensive matching wine list is when you throw a beer in there, that really either gives you some flexibility to have a higher priced, you know, wine in there, or maybe you just make a little bit more margin on the wine list, on the matching wines. That was one little bit of innovation, but there was innovation all throughout the entire experience. So there's a lot of things that they do that were unusual in the way that a normal restaurant would operate because this isn't a normal restaurant. So the way that the food was presented was very unusual and some of the food that they actually had there was unusual as well. Presentation, I think, was probably the biggest area of innovation they had one meal that came out on, looked like almost on a slab of concrete, and it was sprayed at the table with what was some graffiti. I think it was a carrot spray. That's their little riff on Chicago. And he said, you know, it wouldn't be a, a trip to Chicago without seeing some graffiti, so here's our graffiti on a slab of concrete. Now, one of the other meals was presented on a piece of bark from a tree. And so it was obviously a, a wooded type meal and they wanted to represent it by being on a piece of wood. And of course, there was, wasn't actually on the wood, but there was wood and then there was a piece of glass. So they had these plates specifically made for them as a part of the meal. I think that it's really interesting because you, you go, wow, this is amazing. One of the other things that I think was amazing was the anglerfish jaw which was presented in newspaper so and it was quite cute because you know you're at this really expensive restaurant and you've got the jaw of this anglerfish sort of sitting there and it's served in newspaper now i think one of the things that's interesting about this is that that kind of meal is perfect for facebook it's quite in your face you can see the the teeth you can see everything there it looks amazing what is it that you're doing in your restaurant where are you uh, delivering meals to the table that look amazing so that they'll look good on Facebook? And we are seeing more and more restaurants where I actually think that they're actually starting with Facebook and working back to the menu to say what is there that we can come up with, or Instagram for that matter. What is there that we can do that's going to look fantastic on Instagram that people will take a photo of and put on their Facebook page that will drive people to come into our restaurant? So it's that menu engineering that I think that they've done such a great job of by coming up with things that are unique, that look fantastic when you take a photo of them, that really helps to get the word out. And it sets the tone because people want to be able to take a photo of something that looks unusual. And so it's partially it was about the food, partially it was about the presentation. The next thing I thought that they did a really good job of was the process. So the whole process, and it started out with the emails that we received, they contacted us they thanked us for the booking and I know that they've got an innovative booking system there. They, they're trying to do a yield-based booking system where you pay more if it's midweek and you pay higher if it's on the weekend. I think there's a lot of legs in this idea because people generally want to eat on the weekend and so they're more likely to be able to pay it. It's exactly what the airlines do. People who want to fly in the busy times, they pay more for their seat than people who want to fly in the quieter times. We got an email a week or so out, you know, saying if we had any dietary requirements, sort of finalizing the arrangements for everything. Then when we came in, we were greeted and we were left there for a couple of minutes just at the door of the kitchen. So you get to see in and, you know, Alinea being an exciting restaurant or one of the most exciting restaurants in the world we were standing there going, wow, you know, taking photos. And you could see that the people who were in front of us, they were also, look, we're looking in. This is where the magic happens. So I think that the way that they've done, created that process, then we were, of course, we were taken upstairs. Our waiter knew that we came from Australia. He said, wow, you've come all the way from Australia. So the process that they've got, they're setting it up for to be such a special 
event. And it's that attention to detail that they've done such a good job of. The customer really is the focus at a linear. They know that, you know, it's an expensive night out for a lot of people. And so a lot of effort has gone into making that appropriate, treating people in a way that, that sort of recognizes that. Part of the process, I think, you know, the balance in the meal was amazing. So we had the matching wine list and it's 15 courses. At the end of it, I didn't feel full. I mean, I'd obviously had enough. There was 15 courses in there. But I know you go to some degustation menus and it's like, oh, I could not eat one thing more. We weren't at that point. And we'd had a lot to drink as well, but we weren't too drunk. We were well and truly merry. We were really loving the evening, but certainly wasn't too drunk. And I think that that's really important. The balance, it just showed the finesse that came across in everything, the way that we were treated, the front of house experience, all of the food, the tastes, nothing was over the top. There was a lot of finesse in everything that came through. And the whole process sort of massaged that. Training. This was a big thing that I thought you could tell a lot of effort had gone into training the staff, the front of house and back of house staff because they came and showed their presence in some places as well. And it really was, the whole thing ran like a well-oiled machine. There's a lot of front of house staff there. I don't know how many people were looking after our table, but I would have thought four or five and, and maybe even more. The people introducing the food, they knew exactly what it was. They were able to answer questions about it. It was done meticulously. I was having a good look at what was going on in the dining room at the other tables and everything was meticulously followed. So you could tell that it was a well-drilled team that were putting on this experience for everyone. The sommelier was very knowledgeable. He clearly knew a lot about the wine list and was able to answer all of our questions. And I think that that's really important. It's really a bit disappointing when you ask a sommelier a question, he'll recommend a wine and you say, oh, so in what region is it from? Oh, I don't know. You know, you get the feeling that he's just trying to promote what he's got left out the back that isn't selling too well. These guys really knew their stuff. What training is it that you do for your staff? And I know one of the things that we hear is, you know, it's so hard to train staff because they come and go, you know, retention's a big problem. What is it that you're doing to work on retention? And it's easier at a place like Alinea because, you know, there's a mandatory tip included in the bill and I'm sure that they're paid really well. And people want to work there because if you've worked at Alinea, then you can work at any other restaurant in the world. I'm guessing, because it's that caliber of restaurant, it would look amazing on your CV. I suspect that their turnover is pretty low, though. One of the things that I think that restaurant owners really need to do is to focus on decreasing turnover, increasing retention. How many people have a five-minute meeting before service starts where they get the team together and let them know what we're trying to do tonight and, and try and build that sense of team, build that sense of belonging, you know, is there that two-way communication with your team? And if you can do that, and particularly for people who are working on minimum wage, and I know it's a little bit different in Australia, of course, wages are a little bit higher than they are in the US. In the US, people are focused on, you know, try to build their tips. But I think that there's a lot more that restaurant owners all around the world can be doing to try and decrease turnover in their staff. Just finished reading Nick Cirillo's book, Slice of the Pie, and he talks about having 25% annual churn in their staff as opposed to an industry average of 150%. When you're turning over your staff that slowly, you can spend a lot more time on training them and making that investment in them. And I think in a lot of respects, it's chicken and the egg. Do you spend more time training staff who aren't going to be with you? And if you don't do the training, then they're not going to stay around. So you really sort of need to sort of make those baby steps to try and create a culture where training is valued and, you know, provide a career path for them. I think this is something that Alinea does really well. You can just tell the way that people talk, the way that they act. Training is a key part of everything that they do. You just don't get that kind of experience from people who've been working there for a couple of weeks. Turnover's low and they're really, really well trained in everything that they do. Teamwork. So for this podcast, I did a little bit of research into Alinea and 
this is one of the things that I find restaurant owners struggle with because a lot of the time it's them doing everything. You know, you'll have someone who can cook and if they're short front of house, then they'll be doing that as well. And all of these things create a massive amount of pressure on you when you're responsible for everything. So one of the things that you need to do is to build a team. So, of course, there's Grant Akats, who is the chef. And one of the really interesting things about him is that he started the restaurant with Nick Kukonis, co-owner, co-founder. He is the finance guy. So I think he brings a lot of business acumen to the restaurant. And we have seen this time and time again where a chef is trying to run a restaurant, trying to make a lot of financial decisions. It's an area where their expertise doesn't lie and they get into all sorts of problems and and the restaurant goes out of business. Flip side of that is it's hard to build a team that is going to be long-term viable. And one of the things that we see is when there's multiple partners in a restaurant, what happens when one of the partners doesn't want to be there anymore or one of the partners isn't pulling their weight? Getting that balance. And once again, we talk about the finesse, the balance, getting that in your ownership structure is the first part of building the team because it means that the problems are shared. But their team is goes further than that. They've got some really talented people running key parts of the business. So Mike Bagali, Simon Davies, the chef de cuisine, John Schaefer, the, the director of service. They've got people who are responsible for key parts of the product that they deliver. And that helps immeasurably when you're a restaurant owner. So what is it that you can do to try and promote people into those positions? Something to think about. So next is the experience. Okay, so the food there was great. It was really amazing. There was lots of dishes there that was like, oh, wow, you've got to try this. This is amazing. The experience. And it started with, so we got an Uber from the hotel that we were staying at. And he said, I can drop you on this corner. There was a bit of traffic and, you know, we were keen to get there. We were already running five minutes late. So there was a bit of anxiety. We didn't want to be too late. We said, yep, yep, just drop us here. And he goes, it's just down the street. And so we're we're walking down the street and then it should be around here somewhere. It should be around, like, I don't understand where it is. And I reckon that happens quite a lot because there was some guy standing there and he said, are you guys looking for a linear? It's like, yeah, we are. And he goes, okay, it's that door there. And like, we're literally standing right in front of it. And so the door is kind of a little bit hidden. And so we opened it and the entrance is completely amazing. It's sort of like, wow, what's happening here? But that whole thing reminds me of closed door dining that they have in Buenos Aires. And so we were lucky enough to go to Casa Coupage, which is a a great little restaurant run by two sommeliers. And on their website, it doesn't have the address. So you make a booking and then they tell you where it is. And it's kind of like this secret thing that you have to be on the inside to be able to make a booking. And so they said, don't be late, you know, timings are important. And we were about 15 minutes late and we were like, oh, where is it? And I remember vividly running up and down the street in Buenos Aires. We don't speak Spanish very well. We're trying to find this place. And then Tina found it and she goes, I think this is it here. And we knocked on the door and the door opened. And then there was this lovely waitress there and she said, yes, come on in. And it was like, wow, we found it. It was just this relief. And then we were excited to be in there and it set the the night up really well because it was like everything just sort of transitioned to a calm, relaxing, exciting evening. Alinea does the exact same thing except more. The entranceway, quite amazing. And when we sat down at our table, he said, well, you know, strap yourself in. It's going to be quite an experience. And it was there were so many things that just made it a really quite a memorable occasion. And it's one of those things that I think I'll probably never have a similar experience to that. And in some respects, I'm kind of sad because we can go back to a linear, but you can only really ever have your first a linear experience where you know there is so much mystery and so much excitement, so much expectation about what is it that's going to happen. I remember I needed to go to the bathroom halfway through the meal and as I was coming back there was a crowd front of house staff you know waiters sommeliers a couple of chefs and they were all sort of standing there and they parted in front of me and one of them said oh Mr Ealing how is the meal going and I'm not even sure if he was looking after our table but 
it was like I was in a Hollywood movie and sort of the crowd were just parting in front of me. And it was amazing because one of them even knew my name. I think that's the closest I'm ever going to get to feeling like a movie star. When you create that experience for your customers, they will remember that and they will talk about that. It was amazing. Just that feeling I got of watching all of these people because they all turned and it was like, oh, a guest is coming through. They all parted. It was like the parting of the seas and I walked on through and they knew who I was. Completely amazing. And I think the effort that goes into, I'm not sure whether that's something that they rehearse or whether it was just one of those ad hoc things that happened, but to me that was almost the highlight of the night just to see all of these people part and they know my name. Wow, I feel like a movie star. That's the closest I'll ever feel, ever be to feeling like a movie star. Or, uh, closest I'll ever be to being a movie star, I think. The dessert, one of the desserts that they bought out was a, and it's listed on the menu as tropical fruit. And, you know, tropical fruit, that doesn't sound overly exciting. You know, there's a lot of restaurants that have got a fruit platter on their dessert menu. But what they do, and we come back to the innovation in presentation, they clear the table and they put a mat down, and then they built the dessert in front of our eyes. So the chef comes out, and he creates this amazing picture of dessert in front of us, which we then eat. They've taken something like a fruit platter, and lots of restaurants have fruit platters, but the presentation and the innovation, because they've gone out and got some sort of mat, I'm not sure what it was, whether it's some sort of latex or something, but they've got some sort of mat that they can put down and then they build it in front of them. So, yes, you know, there's a little bit of work because they're actually doing it in front of the diners rather than out in the kitchen. So the, the chef's got to come out to do that. But one of those things that I think, you know, everyone was looking at, wow, look at this, amazing. There's a helium balloon, a balloon, and, and you eat it and you, you inhale the helium and then you speak with your, your helium voice, which everyone finds really funny. But you can eat the balloon and it tastes like green apple. And just thinking about it now, you know, I can taste that green apple. It was a, it's an amazing taste to have a balloon that you can eat. And you know what? I think it's designed to be really messy. It's not something that you can eat delicately because once you take a few mouthfuls or breaths of the helium, the sort of balloon sort of collapses and the helium goes everywhere. It sort of like collapses on your hand. And it's like, oh, wow. But it's really nice. It's, it's got that really crisp green apple taste to it. Now, I reckon there's probably a bit of work in that. That's not something that is going to be easy to replicate. But it's those sort of things. How can you innovate in presentation? How can you innovate in the things that you do? What is it that you can take? And of course, this is, you know, interesting molecular gastronomy. What is there that you can do to make that sort of experience? So I think all of that comes back to value. Now, so as you know, we're based in Australia and when we were in Chicago, the Aussie dollar was sitting at about, it was buying about 72 cents US. So the Aussie dollar certainly wasn't doing us any favours. I wish I'd gone the year before, I think it was about a dollar five, would have been significantly cheaper to go then. So when you convert it back to Aussie dollars, it was a really, really, really expensive meal for us. Probably the most I'll ever spend on a night out at a restaurant. Where does that place us with value? And I think it's all summed up by literally one question that my wife asked the next morning. We're talking about it. And Tina said, can we go back there tonight? She's the CFO. She's the one who's used to saying, no, we can't spend money on this. And she wanted to go back that night. She knew full well exactly how much money we'd spent on that. The food, amazing. The presentation, the innovation, the whole, all of those led to creating an experience that was just amazing. And it's that experience where the margin is. Because I know that the food and alcohol costs would have been, I'm guessing, 20% of what we spent. It may be a little bit higher, maybe 25%. It'd be really interesting to talk to Grant and find out about that, but maybe 25%. Maybe it's usually a little bit higher for fine dining. The rest of that margin, the rest of the money that we spent was in the experience. So obviously, you know, they've got, you know, the 
headcount was very high, so their wages are going to be a lot higher than, than a normal restaurant. But all of that went into creating a huge experience. And I think that's my really big take out of, of our night out at Alinea. And that is the thing that I want you to think about in your restaurant. What is it that you can do to make a better experience? So do you talk about how where you source the food from so that you can create a link between your customer and a local farm? Do you want to educate people about the way that you cook the food? Do you want to let people into the kitchen? Do you want to bring the kitchen out to the customer? Is it the way that you present the food? Is it the food itself? You know, can you come up with something that's a little bit different, a little bit innovative? And I'm thinking there's got to be ways all around that you can innovate that create value that customers will pay for. You know, and it doesn't have to be rocket science. So one of the interesting stories that I always talk about is my daughter, Lizzie, her, she's nine, and her favorite restaurant is a place that does fairy bread. So bread and butter with hundred and thousands on it, it's $5. So it's a pretty cheap item on the kids menu, probably the highest margin. How much is a slice of bread and how much is a little bit of butter and hundreds and thousands or sprinkles? If I say to Lizzie, where do you want to go? She'll ask to go back to that restaurant because she loves getting a big plate of fairy bread. That's the only restaurant that I've seen fairy bread. Now, anyone can create that. But if you're a family restaurant, have you really thought about the kids there? So many family restaurants just have chicken nuggets, you know, fish and chips and maybe a little cheeseburger. What is it the kids want to eat? What is it that you can put on the menu so that when I say, well, where are we going to go and eat tonight? Lizzie can be there advocating for that restaurant. She's the evangelist for them because she wants to go back so that she can get fairy bread. What else is there? You know, we talked about the Similan Thai and the way that they presented the rotis in a teepee. You know, change the way that you present the food. So hopefully... You've got something out of this. I really want you to think about the innovation. Think about your team. Think about building your team. And think about the experience that you create for the customer. It's the experience that you create for the customer. That's where the margin is. And so what I'm hoping to do is that hopefully there'll be a little something that you can get in out of this podcast that you can take back and put into your restaurant so that you can put your menu prices up by 5%. Build the profitability so that you can have a holiday, go to Chicago and have a meal at Alinea. (laughs) That's what I would love for everyone listening to the podcast. There's plenty of ideas out there. So have a think about it. Have a look at your menu. Far too many people don't let their menu, far too many people have got a lazy menu. It doesn't really do any work at all. It should be looking great on Facebook. It should be working on Instagram. It should be getting people to come back all the time. So It's not just about having a great sweet and sour pork or a chicken vindaloo. There's got to be something that steps it up that little bit. What is it that you can do to turn your food from just being items on a menu into an experience? So that's all I've got for you today. Make sure you check out the show notes. We'll have some photos from Alinea and we'll have some links to some of the other restaurants that we've talked about in today's podcast. And that's it. Have a busy day. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.